Then we looked at 2 Kings. And this was an interesting account of Elisha the prophet and the Syrians were making war with Israel and the king of Syria thought there was a snitch in the camp, couldn't figure out how are we getting found out every time, why is it we're losing these battles, we're having these meetings in secret, so what's up with this? It, do we have a snitch? We found out no. The king's servant said to him, well, there's a prophet in the camp over there at Israel, and he knows what you do even in your bedchamber. I'm going to say it again. That's true today. So the king wanted to know, well, find out where he is. Found out he was in Dothan. So in the night, the king, the enemy, surrounded the whole city of Dothan with horses, of, horses, chariots. And the servant of Elisha got up the next morning and he saw all of them. And he reacted to what he saw and he ran to tell Elisha the prophet what he saw with these eyes. Elisha did a very interesting thing. He knew then there was power in prayer, and that's something we as the church need to learn today. There's power in prayer. You're not just sending words, a scatter shot, and, oh, I don't know if anybody's hearing this. No, when you take the time to pray a targeted prayer in the name of Jesus to the Father, He hears you, and the minute He hears you and release, you release your faith, that answer is like a target. You've got like a target or whatever you're praying about, that answer is on its way. God heard you. Prayer works. And Elisha knew this because the first thing he did was pray that the Lord would open up the eyes of his servant. Well, the eyes of his servant were open. He saw with these eyes they were surrounded. But the Lord honored that prayer, answered that prayer, and he opened up the eyes of his servant and then his servants saw there was more with them than there was with the enemy. And they had horses of chariots, horses, chariots of fire. Something that the enemy's camp didn't have. They had horses, they had chariots, but not chariots of fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit is a purging fire. I'm telling you what, one touch from the fire of God will purge out a lot of nonsense in our life. And it'll make you radical. You will not care what other people think about you. And it will set you apart from other Christians. That baptism in the fire of the Holy Spirit will cause you to become so radical, just that one encounter with God, the fire of God, will change you, set you apart. Then we looked at John 5, 19 through 23. And again, the religious people are wanting to know, well, by whose authority are you doing these things? Where are you getting this stuff? Jesus answered them. He said, I'm telling you straight. This is out of the Message Bible. Sometimes the Message Bible has some, you just can't miss what God is saying. The Son can't independently do a thing. Only what he sees the Father doing. What the Father does, the Son does. Well, now we know the Father wasn't standing there physically, so he must have been seeing some other way. Must have been seeing some other way. What other way was he seeing? Through the eye of his Spirit. And he was communicating Spirit to Spirit. Well, that was kind of over the head of the religious people. Then we went to Romans 16, 25 through 27, where Paul is talking, teaching about the mysteries of God. We'll go to verse 27. The mystery known by Jesus Christ to God alone wise, the mystery known to God alone wise by Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory into worlds of worlds. Amen. 
Well, the mystery is now made open by scriptures of prophets. The wondering is over. We don't have to go to the world to try to figure out what the end of the book says. We just go to the end of the book. Because the mystery is made open by the scriptures. So if we can read, we can clearly see. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll teach and unveil and take the lid off of those mysteries. And it won't be a mystery anymore. Isn't that simple? You know, mankind tries to complicate things. When God makes hearing from him, living through him, him loving you, you receiving from him, you obeying and answering a call that he has on your life, living the Christian life through the finished work of Jesus Christ, he makes that so simple, so very simple. All you have to do is surrender yourself to Almighty God. Acknowledge the Holy Spirit as your teacher. You can't do that for somebody else, but your teacher. And read the scriptures with an expectation that, that those words on those pages come to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will find a rest that you've never experienced in your life before. So we saw that Paul, the Apostle Paul, he too was teaching along the same lines and experiencing revelation knowledge and then was teaching the church through letters and through speaking in their presence that the mystery has been unveiled by the scriptures, by the prophets. So if we can read, we can find out what the mysteries are, and they're not mysteries anymore. Isn't that simple? Then we went to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ. Well, we said a revelation is something where the mystery is revealed. Now notice, it does not say, this is a secret from Jesus Christ, which God has not allowed him to make known to his servants. Going to keep it a secret. No, no, no. It says this is, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God has allowed him to make known to his servants of things that must soon find their due accomplishment. And he has sent his angel to disclose the pattern of it to his servant John. So again, we see that revelation is knowledge that was kept secret at one time, but now the lid is off. And who takes the lid off? The Holy Spirit. But how does that happen? He takes the lid off by you just acknowledging, you're my teacher, you're the revealer of all truth. Jesus said that. You can't lie by saying what the Word of God says. Now we're going to go to Matthew. And this is when Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. Now he has been questioned at length by the religious people. They continually were trying to find out, well, who qualified you? How is it by whose authority are you doing these things? So Jesus went, Matthew 16, 13 through 18. So Jesus went to the area of Caesarea Philippi. He said to his followers, the disciples, Who do people say I am? They answered, Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Elijah was one of the prophets. And some say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to his followers, And who do you say I am? 
And Simon Peter answered, you got to love Peter. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now I want you to see how Jesus answered him. We spoke earlier that Jesus said to the religious people, the problem is you haven't seen him referring to Almighty God in this. You haven't, but I have seen him. I have recognized him. Now keep that in mind concerning the answer that Jesus, the comment Jesus made to Peter when Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. No one taught you that. My father in heaven showed you who I am. Wow. Do you know, that is still true today. Unless the Holy Spirit reveals to you who Jesus Christ is, you will struggle. Because Jesus said, no one taught you that. We have far too many churches in America today that are just teaching information and not encouraging and inspiring the people to seek God, to acknowledge the Holy Spirit as their teacher, so that Jesus can say to you, just like he said to Peter, no one taught you that. My Father in heaven showed you who I am. That's available today. There are people who live in countries where they don't have a church to go to every week. There aren't conferences. They're sneaking around trying to watch conferences on the Internet. A word here, a word there. I think of when we lived in Saudi Arabia and how the people were so hungry that they risked their life to come to a meeting. We risked our life by even having a meeting. But you know, that didn't matter. Never even thought about that. As far as every day in sort of a dreadful way. Didn't think about that. We were so hungry for God, and I, we still are. I'm as much on fire, if not more, I am more than I ever was. Because I see the importance of revelation knowledge and that each child of God know how to connect, hear from the Holy Spirit for himself or herself. Because you might find yourself in a remote place. And if you don't know how to do your own praying, you don't know the voice of your shepherd for yourself, you're going to find yourself in a very unhappy, unrestful, and possibly unsafe position. That's why it is so important that church today not become a club. We in America have so much, but it's not a club. That's what the Elks and the Moose Lodge and all of that is for. It's not a social event. It's not where people go bowling and pizza parties and car washes. and That's not why we're there. God will provide those things if he sees fit that we need them. But that's a place where we go to get recharged, to iron, uh, to sharpen each other. As I said, iron sharpens iron. But if everybody is asleep, and even the leadership is asleep, and the fire of God is not there, the fire of the Holy Spirit, 